Welcome to this message by Ray Steadman titled, Don't Back Down, Build Up, from RaySteadman.org. The text for this message is from Nehemiah 4 and 5. I'm sure everyone by now is well acquainted with what is called Murphy's Law. <laughs> the idea that if anything can go wrong, it will. Most of us have had experience of that. Uh, there are many applications of it. You know that uh, if uh, you try to fix something, it's going to take longer than you anticipate. It will cost more than you allowed for. It will break down before you get it paid for. And somebody won't like it when it's through. And that's Murphy's Law. And I think we come to some such a scene in Nehemiah chapter 4, where... Uh, uh, Nehemiah faces now the outbreak of some very severe and violent opposition to him. Uh, we've been looking, for you who have not uh, been following with us, we've been looking at this story of the rebuilding of the walls and gates of Jerusalem and how they picture for us the steps to recovery from the areas of damage or ruin in our own lives. Uh, we've been following Nehemiah as he uh, is uh, engaged in this great project. We've seen his concern and his heartfelt anguish over the damage and the ruin of the city, of the capital city of his country, and it echoes something of the concern and the uh, anguish that many of us may feel about areas that have been damaged in our own lives by sinful habits or by attitudes or long-standing feelings of bitterness or whatever it may be that has hurt us and damaged us. We've uh, followed Nehemiah in his quick response to the opportunity to rebuild that was given to him, and it echoes our own need to respond to opportunity that may be given to us to recover We've seen uh, uh, Nehemiah's honest facing of the magnitude of the task when he got to Jerusalem. He took a careful survey of the walls and the gates to see how much he had to do. And we noted his first uh, meeting with the enemies that would oppose him later. And finally, his care in organizing and sharing the labor of this great project and getting this whole great enterprise underway. Now, when you come to chapter 4, Murphy's Law takes over. Opposition now takes off its gloves, and the real battle to succeed actually begins. And as we'll see in just a moment, almost always the first attempt of the enemy, because we have an enemy, we've been singing about him, or still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. Martin Luther said. And behind every effort on our part to, to clean up our act and get our lives together and recover from damage and hurt and ruin, we will find opposition from the enemy. And almost always the first attempt of the enemy to stop recovery is to discourage us through the threat of ridicule or derision or, or, uh, rejection. And you find that here in these opening verses, verses 1 through 3. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? And Tobiah, the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, if even a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their wall of stone. You can hear the scorn, the derision, the sarcasm, in those uh, in those comments that they were making, and uh, many of uh, 
of us, I think, have experienced this kind of attack. I, I know personally, I'm sure you do too, know people that are afraid to do what is right because they're afraid that their, uh, their friends will laugh at them, will begin to mock them. I know, uh, I know a man right now that is afraid to stop drinking because his drinking friends will make fun of him, and yet drink is destroying his life. I know others who are hooked on drugs, and they don't want to stop because they're afraid they'll be laughed at if they do. Hundreds, thousands perhaps of young people have been trapped in a habit that has destroyed them because of the fear of ridicule. So it's a powerful weapon that the enemy employs here. Incidentally, when you remember who these enemies of Israel are, you may get a strong sense of deja vu, because Sanballat is the governor of Samaria. And that's the area of Palestine that we refer to today as the West Bank. And uh, Tobiah is the representative of Ammon, the country Ammon, which today is known as the, as the country of Jordan. And uh, in verse 7, we learn that this coalition includes Arabs and the men of Ashdod, and Ashdod is the Gaza. So it's rather interesting, isn't it, that history has repeated itself in our own day. And probably this afternoon, turning on your television, you'll see these same these enemies from this same geographic area still uh, arrayed against the forces of Israel. Now, I'm not making a comment here at this point as to the justice of one cause or the other, simply pointing out that it's amazing how up-to-date this account is and how history does repeat itself in the, uh, in the stories of the Bible. The first weapon that is mentioned here is, of course, ridicule and mockery. And many of us have had to experience that kind of thing. Have you ever had somebody say to you when you were trying to stop something that was wrong, what do you, who do you think you are? Do you think you're better than we are? Or perhaps somebody says, well, you've made a good start, but you won't hold out. You won't last. I was uh, interested during watching the inauguration to see how many of the commentators and the reporters who at the beginning of uh, Reagan's years had uh, greeted him with hoots of derision and scorn were at last acknowledging that he was a man of honor and had done some great things for this country. And uh, Nehemiah seems to be that kind of a man. He, he persists against all this enmity. Now notice particularly what his response was to this. It's given to us in verses 4 and 5. And as you might expect from this man, it's one of prayer. Hear us, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders, or as the margin says, they have provoked you to anger before the builders. He sees this as an insult against God himself. Now notice he doesn't argue back. He doesn't try to retaliate. He doesn't uh, blister them with... Uh, uh, angry language himself, but he prays. Reminds us, doesn't it, of Peter's words about Jesus. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. And this is a picture of how to handle that kind of thing. Well, you say, but this is a very strange prayer. Uh, actually, Nehemiah is asking for the destruction of these people. What happened to forgiveness? Where's love? This sounds like a prayer the 49ers would pray for the Bengals, isn't it? <laughs> Give them over to plunder, and so forth. I've got a short list of people that I would feel somewhat like praying this 
sort of prayer for. But uh, I think we need to understand and, and remember something very important about this kind of prayer. You see, Jesus taught us to bless those who persecute us, to pray for our enemies and those who despitefully use us, and to do good for them. And people read a prayer like this and they say, well, that's a, this is something entirely different. How do you square that with what our Lord taught? The answer, of course, is to remember who this is that's praying. This isn't Nehemiah, the... Uh, uh, the ordinary citizen, the individual man who's been injured by somebody attacking him personally. This is the governor of Judea praying about maintaining order and peace in his land and forwarding the progress of a work that God himself had sent him to do. You see, this is uh, a different kind of prayer because it's a prayer of authority to handle the problem of evil. Many of us were were deeply uh, concerned and uh, hurting with the people over in the city of Stockton uh, concerning the incident of uh, a killer who came onto a playground and opened up fire on the helpless children there and killed a number of them. And what would you think of the authorities uh, who, if that killer had not taken his own life but was still abroad, were expecting to treat him with forgiveness. You see, the first task of government is not mercy but justice. Now, mercy comes in when it's an individual matter, but justice must prevail. And I'm sure there'd be a outcry in the whole of the nation if uh, if the authorities... Uh, treated a man like that with uh, w- with grace and forgiveness instead of with uh, bringing him to justice and seeing that this uh, crime was paid for. And so uh, Nehemiah returns to the work as recorded in verse 6. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height for the people worked with all their heart. This ridicule and sarcasm did not destroy their confidence, and they went ahead with the work. But the enemy is not through. And uh, we see that uh, when they see how their tactics of uh, ridicule have failed, they grow even angrier and resolve on force. Look at verses 7 and 8. But when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed. They were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. Here the enemy mobilizes its forces and actually resorts to violence. And this is always the escalation. When when you begin to move with God, when you begin to change things in your life for the better, you will find you're met, first of all, with derision. And then if you keep on persisting, somebody's going to get very upset with you and perhaps even tell you off in some sharp and vicious vitriolic way. But notice how Nehemiah reacts. His reliance is still on prayer. Verse 9. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Prayer and preparedness. He isn't just praying. He does more than prayer. But he doesn't just prepare, post a guard. He prays as well. And this blending of the resources of the spiritual life with the, with the uh, resources of uh, the material and the physical world is a marvelous picture of how believers ought to face problems with a recognition that we need action on both levels. Uh, but still the enemy persists, and this time he begins a propaganda campaign. Look at verses uh, uh, 10 and 12 here. 
10 through 12. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, the strength of the laborers is giving out, and there's so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. This is understandable. There was a tremendous amount of debris and rubble and broken stones, and they had to clear that all away first before they could get to the walls, and it must have been very discouraging. I imagine it was like trying to move out of a house that you've lived in for 33 years. My wife and I are actually doing that right now. And the amount of rubble that is left is very <laughs> discouraging. And sometimes we think it's never going to end. Now these people were at that point. And taking advantage of that sense of weakness and discouragement, the enemies also said, verse 11, before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and we'll kill them and put an end to the work. See, there's no mincing words about that. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over. That's a sign they're very agitated by this. Wherever you turn, they will attack us. So here's an enemy now that offers to wipe them out. And, and they mean this threat against them. I wonder if any of you have faced something like that. Do you ever, do you ever find at work that you were threatened when you tried to correct perhaps an immoral practice that was being indulged in around you and somebody said to you, look, uh, you, you keep that up and you may lose your job here. You may be demoted. You may even be evicted from your apartment, whatever it may be. Somebody may offer to meet you out in the parking lot and a physical attack. These kind of things are quite possible. Now notice Nehemiah's response, and it's very enlightening here and helpful, very deliberate through the rest of the chapter. First of all, he carefully looks over the situation. Verse 12, uh, or verse 13. Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords and spears and bows. And after I look things over, I, I'm just going to stop there for the moment. You see, he's carefully evaluating and assessing what's needed. And I tell you, this kind of approach is necessary if we're going to change our own life. We have to uh, notice where we're under attack, where it is that we are at addicted to some wrong habit or some drug or some attitude of mind or some bitterness of spirit. What brings it on? And post a guard at that point to watch for that kind of an attack. And he assesses the situation. It's a, it's a kind of a modern version of what uh, some of us remember in World War II after the attack on Pearl Harbor when there was a popular song that said, Praise the Lord and pass the ammunition. And that's what he's doing here. Then second, he reviews the spiritual resources available. Verse 14. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers, your sons, and your daughters, your wives, and your homes. And when our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot, and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. You see what happened? When Nehemiah reminded them that because they were believers... They had a power at work in their lives that nobody else knew about or could you. That they had invisible resources they could count on. The great and awesome God who was with them would stand beside them. They became so en en nerved and renewed in their courage that the enemy saw that they could get nowhere. God had frustrated this by a simple reminder that he was with them. One of my favorite passages of the New Testament is found in Paul's letter to Timothy. 
Paul's a prisoner, you remember, in Rome. And Timothy is all alone in the great city of Ephesus, pagan city. And he's discouraged. He's a rather timid young man to start with. And the great apostle writes to him, and he gives him this word of advice. Remember, he says, Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. See, you're not alone. God is with you. He's risen. He's awesome. He's strong. He's powerful. And reckon upon that, and you'll be able to stand against the most subtle temptations and the most vitriolic threats that come against you. Uh, then he goes on uh, uh, he, to maintain the readiness with which he has, uh, has set this up. Uh, in verse 16, From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows, and armor. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. You get the picture? He combines now the work with the war. And each man goes to work with a, an instrument in his hand for labor, and with the other hand he holds a sword and is ready, therefore, for battle. Charles Spurgeon, that great English preacher, had a, published a newspaper in his church called The Sword and the Trowel. And he said this was what is necessary for Christians always, to be aware of the battle and the building both, and to do be faithful for both. And then in verse uh, 22, or 21, I'm sorry, uh, I keep losing my place because there are two chapters I'm working with here. Uh, he's, he says, Then I said in verse 19, To the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there, and our God will fight for us. There's always this wonderful blending of faith and uh, preparation. Verse 21, then, shows the, uh, uh, verse 22 uh, through the end of the chapter, shows the amount of self-sacrifice involved. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time I also said to the people, Have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night so they can serve us as guards by night and workmen by day. And neither I, nor my brothers, nor my men, nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon, even when he went for water. There's an alertness, a vigilance here that doesn't even allow for uh, comfort, but a readiness to endure hardness for the sake of the Lord, to put it in New Testament terms. Now the unseen enemy that he's engaged with tries another approach in chapter 5. We'll move through this rather quickly. But uh, he has successfully uh, quenched the attack from without. Now he runs into the problem within. That's revealed in verse 1. Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their Jewish brothers. Here you see is internal strife. No longer attack from without, but trouble from within. And you may experience that in your struggle to uh, recover some area of your life. Uh, you run into family problems and family pressures and difficulty from those who work with you and even from other brothers and sisters in the Lord. And in this case, it was a clash between the workers, and the officials or the rulers, the, the executives who were, who were working on this project. They were both Jews, but it's a class struggle here and uh, is uh, typical of class struggles. There are many complaints about them. Verse 2 says, Some were saying, We and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. 
See, they, they had no time to plant crops. They were working on the wall day and night, and yet they had to eat, and it was difficult. And what made it difficult was, as verse 3 reveals, others were saying, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. Does this sound like some of you? You have to mortgage your property to make a living or to stay at work where you are. And still others were saying, we've had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. The IRS was at work, you see, back in these days as well. And they said, although we are the same flesh and blood as our countrymen, and though our sons are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. In those days, if you couldn't pay your tax or couldn't pay your debts, you sold your children or your wife, last of all yourself, of course, into slavery, and thus paid your debts that way. And as they said, some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards belong to others. Now, to a great degree, these were justified complaints. And Nehemiah uh, deals with them earnestly and forthrightly, as he tells us here now in, in verse 6, he was upset by that. He couldn't change the condition, but now he, re- he reveals the real problem. When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. I pondered them in my mind and then accused the nobles and the officials. I told them, you are exacting usury from your own countrymen. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them and said, as far as possible, we have bought back our Jewish brothers who were sold to the Gentiles. But now you are selling your brothers only for them to be sold back to us. And they kept quiet because they could find nothing to say. They knew they were doing wrong. Usury, of course, is charging interest for money that has been loaned. It's a very common practice in our day. And there were, even the Jews were allowed to do it with uh, other races. But one thing was prohibited. Moses had spoken directly to this issue. And he said that when a Jew had to borrow money from another Jew, he was not to charge any interest. He was to loan the money, but he was loaning it to a brother, and therefore there was to be no interest. If you look at verse 11, it tells us what the amount of interest was. It was a one hundredth part, that is per month, which would be one percent per month and a total of 12 percent per year, which uh, doesn't sound very much like to us, does it? But it was enough to outrage Nehemiah. The loan sharks were at work in those days as well, and he is upset by this and demands that they stop that. He said to them, What you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? I and my brothers and my men are also lending money, the people money and grain, but let the exacting of usury stop. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, and houses, and also the usury you are charging them, the hundredth part of the money, grain, new wine, and oil. And their reaction was, we will give it back, they said, and we'll not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. See, they were stricken by conscience because they knew from the scriptures that this was wrong. And it suggests that as believers... We ought to be very careful about uh, taking advantage of others, especially other Christians, and uh, getting rich at their expense. And this is a practice that's everywhere in Scripture condemned. Now, Nehemiah is encouraged, I'm sure, to have them promise that they'll not do this, but he doesn't stop with that. Notice. Then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and officials take an oath to do what they promised. I also shook out the folds of my robe and said, In this way may God shake out of his house and possession every man who does not keep this promise. That was an oriental way of emphasizing that this was a 
some a very serious matter which God would act upon. And at this the whole assembly said, Amen, and praise the Lord, and the people did as they had promised. I was encouraged listening to the inaugural address when President Bush spoke of the sacredness of promises. And you recall, he even mentioned oaths taken on marble steps, which had to be kept as well. And this is the case here. Now, in the rest of the chapter, beginning with verse 14, you have the final uh, action of Nehemiah to overcome this, uh, this internal strife. First, he airs the real cause. He shows that it's the greed of certain people, and he rebukes them for it. He confronts them with it and shows them it's wrong and gains their promise by God's help always to stop this kind of a practice. There's a place and time for, for forthright, blunt confrontation in our Christian lives. And sometimes we need to point out to people what you're doing is wrong and to help them to see what needs to be done. And he does that. But now there's one final thing he does. Moreover, he says, from the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, until his 32nd year, 12 years, neither I nor my brothers ate the food allotted to the governor. But the earlier governors, those preceding me, placed a heavy burden on the people and took 40 shekels of silver from them in addition to the food and wine, and their assistants also lorded it over the people. Here's a familiar picture, isn't it? Officials who get rich by being elected to office and who use their power to, for their own advantage, to build up their own lavish lifestyle, build expensive homes at the expense of others, and, uh, and then treat them with disdain and scorn and lord it over the people. But Nehemiah says, I did not do that. And notice his, his motivation. But out of reverence for God, I did not act like that. Instead, I devoted myself to the work on this wall. All my men were assembled there for the work, and we did not acquire any land. What's his motivation? Well, it was not in order to, uh, uh, to simply win favor among the people or to win a re-election to the job not even merely to correct previous extortion. It was because he loved God, because he was grateful for what God had done to him. And motivated by gratitude, he passed it on to others. And this is the most beautiful of Christian virtues and graces, is that we learn to, as Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. Now, characteristically, he cho closes this with prayer. In verse uh, 17, he says, Furthermore, a hundred and fifty Jews and officials sat at my, ate at my table, as well as those who came to us from the surrounding nation. Each day, one ox, six choice sheep, and some poultry were prepared for me, and every ten days an abundant supply of wine of all kinds. Now, where did this come from? Well, it was at his own expense. He had every right to this as the governor, but he did not take it. He paid for it himself. For he says, in spite of all this, I never demanded the food allotted to the governor because the demands were heavy on these people. What a beautiful picture of compassion and concern for those around who had much less and a willingness to sacrifice himself in order to help them and to allow them even to eat at his table the food that he had to pay for himself. And so he closes this account with a very brief prayer, this great man of prayer. Remember me with favor, O my God, for all I have done for these people. Does that sound like self-serving prayer to you? Like he's bargaining with God? Look at all I've done, Lord. You owe me blessing because of that. Well, some people read that that, that way, 
But it really isn't that. I think we're reading it wrongly if we read it that way. What he's doing is recognizing God's gracious promises. God has always promised that those who walk with him, he will care for their needs. He will help them. He will not always economically, not always materially. He will bless them. It may be spiritual blessings in the midst of still extreme poverty. This has often been the case, but God will always bless. In chapter 6 of Hebrews, the writer says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. And you can count on that. And so what Nehemiah is really praying is, Lord, I sought to do your will, and now respond according to your gracious nature. He doesn't demand anything. He doesn't ask anything specifically. He doesn't bargain with God about anything. He just is calling upon God to honor his promise. And this is what we often do in prayer. Now then, as we close these two chapters, uh, there are two major lessons that loom for us out of them. First, when we face enmity, we should do so with careful preparation and perseverance and, above all, prayer. But when we face discord and uh, internal strife, let us do so with justice, with confrontation, and with a good example ourselves. And thus, God will enable us to solve the problems and move toward the rebuilding of the ruin of our lives. Now, let's close in prayer, and then we'll ask Doug to lead us in a closing hymn. Thank you, our Father, for this great book and this lesson from it. Strengthen us, then, to act like Nehemiah of old and and stand against the pressures of our day. Be men and women, Lord, who who visibly live according to what we profess. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
securely in the strength of the Lord. Every heart will surely come in the door.